Okay, welcome back everyone. I hope you uh, got some caffeine and some sugar. We're on the last push. Pat yourselves on the back, you made it to the bitter end. This has been a wonderful day. Um, I, I introduce myself, my name is Anna Dragsbeck. I'm the president and CEO of the Immunization Partnership. It has been my great pleasure and honor to work with Dr. Hotez and Jennifer Herricks on um, a, that piece of legislation that you heard about at lunchtime. And um, I'm really excited to be here today. This is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I spent a total of 12 years living overseas. Um, six of those were in the trenches in Sierra Leone. And uh, I've seen those, those people uh, who are affected by some of these diseases. Um, I've watched them die. I've um, watched them suffer. And so um, I appreciate... Um, uh, Sarah's talk earlier about you know connecting a face to the issue because uh, I think that's critically important. So um, delighted to see you all here. The way that this is going to work is we've got um, just like the last panel some very distinguished guests who are going to um, each share with you some of the work that they've been doing, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So feel free to jot down your questions as we go. We're going to start off with Karina Perotti Fuchs, who is the medical coordinator of Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Doctors Without Borders in Mexico. She's been working with MSF for 14 years and in the last five years spe uh, specifically in the implementation of Chagas uh, projects in Bolivia, Paraguay, and Mexico. Dr. Fuchs implemented public health projects on the coast of o Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want to make sure I said that right. Which expanded the diagnosis and treatment of Chagas disease to the level of primary care physician as a pilot project. She has a master's in international public health from the Instituto De Salud Carlos III of Madrid, and anthropology from Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. I apologize for my horrible Spanish. Please help me welcome Dr. Fuchs. So I would like, before you leave, to have a, a clear picture about uh, Chang's disease. Uh, this is the neglected disease that MSF is working with here in, in Latin America. Uh, we have been working with Chagas in the last, for the last 15 years uh, in Bolivia, in Paraguay, and now in Mexico, and also in Central American countries at the very beginning, like Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador. So why uh, Doctor Without Borders works uh, with Chagas? Because within their portfolio, within their uh, operational priorities, we have this neglected disease, no? Chagas disease. Uh, as I say, we start in 1999 with Chagas disease in Central America. And during this year, we, we changed uh, many strategies and, and we tried to prove uh, many different ways to, to work and to reach the patient. We changed from what we call um, community strategy, where um, uh, MSF uh, teams goes to the community to do the treatment of the patient, uh, to mainly integrated com uh, strategy, where what we do is train the, MSF, the, train the staff in the health center so they can do the diagnosis and they can do the treatment. Also what we can prove, we wanted to prove during this year is that it's possible to treat Chagas disease and that the treatment is safe. And during uh, many years, um, they say that, okay, there is no need to tr treat Chagas disease because all the severe effects that have the treatment. So what we wanted really to prove is that we can treat uh, Chagas disease and with the correct supervision of the treatment it's possible to treat the patient and also it's safe. So what we did during these 15 years, no, we, we treat more than 8,000 patients uh, in all of these countries and we have only four severe uh, side effects mm. uh, out of these 8,000 patients. What we are doing now in Mexico, so in Mexico, we wanted to try a, a new approach. As I said, we wanted to do an integrated treatment. What does it mean? Um, we have a team that goes to the, to the health center. We are working in six in, in 10 health centers in Oaxaca states. And we do the training of the, of the team. And they are doing the diagnosis. And they are doing the treatment and the follow-up of the patients. Um, what are the main problems we have, uh, we found in Mexico and why uh, we decided to work there? Um, mainly because uh, the data really underestimated, so there is no a clear picture about the prevalence of the, of the disease. On the other side, we, we know that 
uh, health staff is not well trained, so it's impossible that they do the diagnosis or they, or they look for the disease if they don't know that the that the, that tagus exists. Um, at the same time, uh, there is no treatment available at the primary healthcare level. This is really a problem because a patient, if they want to get treated, they need to go to the hospital, and even at hospital level, it takes two or three months sometimes to get the treatment from the national program. So um, what we want to do before finishing our, our project, as I said, the main, the main the aim of our project was to, to train a staff to demonstrate that we can do treatment at primary health care level. And also we want to work in a guideline for a scaling up of diagnosis and treatment. And we are going to, to work this guideline uh, together with the National Institute of Public Health. The idea is to, to provide to other actors or to state actors with a guideline to, to replicate the project that we did um, in a simple way, let's say, with the resources they have and with the possibility that the state have. And this guideline, the idea of this guideline is to include um, uh, the training we did, but uh, um, according to the possibilities uh, for the training they have, and, and also all, all, the, um, all the ways we use to do the treatment and to do the diagnosis. So the idea is that they have a guideline to replicate uh, the activities in any other state. Two minutes. Mm -hmm. No, mainly is that, well, mm, no, it's okay. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. Well, there's lots of time for questions. Um, so we're going to move on to our next speaker, Andrew Natsios. Um, so is there, are there any Aggies in the audience? Can I get a Thank whoop? God there's someone here. <laughs> Can I get a whoop? <laughs> Another one here? Okay, great. Um, because I have wonderful news. Um, <laughs> Andrew Natsios is, um, is a new, newly um, converted Aggie. <laughs> that was the first thing I learned about him. Um, he also has um, many other accolades. He is an executive professor and director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs. Um, he was most recently a distinguished professor Professor in the practice of diplomacy at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at uh, Georgetown University and former administrator uh, for USAID. As a USC, USAID administrator from 2001 to 2006, Natsios managed uh, reconstruction programs in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Sudan. Those are some hot spots. Um, and um, he also served as U.S. Special Envoy to Sudan in 2006 to 2007, retired from the U.S. Army Reserves at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after 23 years. Natsios is a veteran of the Gulf War. Thank you, sir, for your service. From 1993 to 1998, he was the Vice President of World Vision U.S., the largest faith-based non-governmental organization in the world with programs in 103 countries. Earlier in his career, Natsio served in the Massachusetts House of Representatives and as the Chief Financial Officer, uh, Chief Financial and Administrative Officer of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He also served as CEO of Boston's Big Dig, the largest construction program in American history after a cost overrun scandal. He is the author of three books and he has contributed to 13 others. Please welcome Andrew Natsio. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. Uh, Peter asked me to talk about the inception of the NTD program with respect to AID, and of course he was one of the, uh, the people who I, I didn't realize the central role until more recently because the career people came in and said, Andrew, you've been going to the field, you see all the programs, and you notice that the diseases that you are seeing treated cannot be pronounced by 98% of the American people and certainly any member of Congress except for a couple of doctors perhaps. And uh, I said yes and it annoys me a lot. We don't have much money for those diseases they're getting treated for. The diseases that we appropriate money for are ones that Americans are familiar with. There's always an annual appropriation of $30 million for the Rotarians' anti-polio campaign to eradicate polio. And of course many of you may know that there's a standard, I think it's seven years, if there's not one case of a disease for seven years, WHO will declare the disease no longer exists. And that's been the case for, for smallpox. We almost eliminated 
uh, polio t 12 years ago, and there are three provinces in Ni Nigeria, and the sad story is that Al-Qaeda was sent messages through all the mosques that if you had your child immunized, they would be sterile. They would be uh, unable to have children. And I, I, I remember giving Colin Powell the report from our field staff saying, we have it isolated here. The only polio left in the world is in these three provinces. And we can't go in and immunize the kids because they'll get killed because people think they're hurting the kids. Well, I have to tell you what we did later, which we should have done earlier, we went all over to other Muslim countries and we get the Muslim Doctors Association to issue fatwas saying, if you do not have your child immunized, you're in violation of Quranic teaching. Mm -hmm. We did that in India, we did it in Bangladesh, we did it in um, Indonesia, the largest Muslim country. It was very effective. Al-Qaeda didn't know what to say once a fatwa had been issued by the doctors. But we should have done that in, in Nigeria 15 years ago, and we didn't involve the religious leaders, which was a big mistake. But So we, it got loose again, and we're trying to now, ice, when I say we, I still think I'm at AID, even though I retired nine years ago. So the career staff came in and said, we're spending money on polio. People know what malaria is, because we used to have it in the US years ago, and it's so well known. Uh, and, and when people go to the developing world, they always have to take their pills with them. Uh, and, of course, uh, HIV AIDS, because that's a disease that Americans get. The problem, of course, it, uh, and our, the other health programs, AID, a third of AID's budget is health. It's the largest sector. Many health officers say, Andrew, we're spending too much on health. How about more money on governance and roads and other things? I said, no, nope, we got support here. We're not going to cut back on the program. So they came in, and they, I had never heard the term in fact, the, the acronym we did not use, we simply said neglected tropical diseases. And I said, if we keep repeating it, then we can begin to use the acronym NTD for it. Of course, I knew STD. So <laughs> I said, is it, what's the STD and NTD? And I had to explain to me the, the you know, the one, one is very different than the other. So that was the first year. And we put it, I think it was uh, in 2004, that it was first presented as an idea in staff meeting. And I, I said, you don't have to argue with me, put it in the budget. And uh, we attempted to get through in the beginning of it, and it didn't get through Congress, as I recall, the second year it got through. Was it in 2005, Peter, was it? 2005, and then yeah. I think the, the real money came in 2006. Right, after I left. But we, we, we put it in earlier than that. It was simply, in, in the, the politics of Washington, nothing ever gets through the first year unless there's an emergency. Uh, and so it, it began its inception there. I can't take credit for it. It's the career officers and Ann Peterson, who was the head of the Global Health Bureau, who came in and presented the case, which was, it was not hard to convince me, I have to say. But the second thing I want to talk about is um, I was part of the whole effort at a lower level to deal with the threat of uh, a, an influenza outbreak. President Bush read John Barry's best-selling history of the 1918 pandemic called The Great Influenza. If you read a scary book, read mm -hmm. The Great Influenza. It's now called The Five Billion Dollar Book because he got so upset reading it, he called in NIH and CDC and he said, if we have a repetition of 1918, how fast can we produce the vaccines to immunize the American people? And the, the NIH and CDC said, we can't. We don't have the capacity to produce 300 million vaccines. And he said, you mean I am going to preside over 10 million people dying and I can't, we can't stop it? He said, well, we can do some things, but we can't produce 300 million vaccines. So he proposed a $5 billion emergency supplemental. All of us in the cabinet and some cabinet positions had to go to NIH and listen to him give an hour lecture. I have to say, I had no idea what he was talking about. NIH wrote it, wrote it. And he read it, and he said, you're going to listen to it whether you like it or not, and it's all about, about influenza vaccine and H1 and N1. And I, I began to learn a lot about this because it was, the president was focused on it, and when you get $5 billion, you know, you do focus attention more. So that led to something very interesting for Texas. I don't know if you know this, but Texas A&M now has one of the huge vaccine centers that have been built. It's about to open up. Actually, there's three huge centers, but we've spent $862 million, uh, I'm sorry, $912 million on these vaccine plants. We can now produce at Texas A&M uh, a 
50 million vaccines in three months. And it's a plant-based system, not egg-based system for developing the vaccines, which is why we got the contract. There are two more of these centers that have been built as a result of the 10-year-old uh, supplemental. And then President Obama, who shared President Bush's concern with this, put another supplemental through. And so we now have three vaccine plants that can be shifted into producing mass vaccines. But of course, they produce enough for us. The debate I had is I said, what about the rest of the world? They said, no one else has anything like this, these facilities. So we have started an initiative at the Bush School on pandemics. Now, someone said, Andrew, we don't have any pandemic experts. I said, actually, we do. My deputy, uh, who's a retired colonel, Don Bailey, was the head of uh, uh, CBR, and uh, Chemical, Biological, Radiological Warfare, at the Pentagon before he retired as a colonel. He has three master's degree, and he is an expert in biosecurity from a counterterrorism standpoint, because there is a threat. People don't want to talk about it, but there is a threat. And we we're very worried about that. So we initiated this. I, I know emergency response. The teams that went into West Africa were teams that we started in AID 25 years ago They're called DART teams, Disaster Assistance Response Teams. They're almost military-like units. They're AID officers, of course, and they led the team, and the US military and CDC reported to the DART team, because they have the capacity to be expeditionary. They can go within a day. They can leave Washington, go to any place on Earth. They have, they're self, completely self-contained. They can feed themselves, house themselves, and they are the ones that led the whole logistical effort to deal with the problem. So um, we, we're going to have, an, we had, just had a summit two weeks ago and we're going to have an annual summit every year to go over policy reforms in the US and Texas and in the international system. WHO is not set up to deal with pan pandemics, and they proved that during the Ebola emergency. Mm -hmm. So we will each year uh, have this conference. It's off the record. And we had 65 federal officials come. And I said, is this inconvenient for you? And this is a very interesting response. We thought we made a mistake having it at College Station. It's, it's a remote part of Texas, mm -hmm. let alone of, of, uh, of the country. And um, they said, no, we feel more secure here because it's very unlikely the Washington Post is following us to hear, <laughs> to report on these confidential conversations about what we should do. And they were very candid. In fact, they're all shocked that all of them were being so honest about what, how screwed up the whole system is in the US and the world system. And they made a lot of, because these are all technical people, these are career people, and they told us what we needed to fix it and we're going to now issue a policy paper that will be widely distributed in Washington about what we need to do, change law. I'll just end with one thing. If we have a pandemic like 19, 1918, at the upper end of estimates, 5% of the world's population died in a year. 100 million people. The greatest catastrophe of the 20th century is not the Second World War. It is the pandemic of 1918. Imagine if 5% of the world's population died next year, 350 million people. Well, what would the consequence of that be? We're not prepared for it, and we, we had a little wake-up call with six cases of Ebola, and the entire country was in hysterics, as you know. I don't mean hysterics, funny hysterics. I mean there was panic. And we, we have not put the systems in place in the United States to deal with it. Wow, that's um, an eye opener. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, like I said, you're going to have time for questions later. I'm sure you probably have a lot. OK, we're going to move right along to Ava Moya, who is an assistant professor of social work at the University of Texas at El Paso. Moya tackles, tackles issues in border health, community organizations, and U.S.-Mexico social work and public policy. Her work focuses on research in health disparities, and she has been involved in advocacy for infectious diseases, such as tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. Moya is the chair of the Kellogg Fellow Leadership Alliance. She received her Ph.D. in interdisciplinary health health sciences from University of Texas at El Paso in 2010 and her master's of social work degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Please help me welcome Dr. Moya. So much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, when I received the invitation, I want to acknowledge uh, Tony Bayan for sort of like calling, asking, and I said, you know, Tony, I think I know very little about tropical diseases, I know a little bit more about poverty, and I've lived the U.S.-Mexico border all my life. 
And I said, I'm not sure I can contribute to the conversation yet. If it is about neglect, and it is about disease, and it's about advocacy and policy, then I'll be happy to share some perspectives. And so thank you for sort of like um, sending the invitation. And so what I would like to do is do a couple of things within the next five minutes. One is to really get us thinking about the term neglect, which at the end of the day, it really brings us back to making a choice. And the choice is we have failed to act. That's a reminder. And so if that is right at the heart of this legacy that we want to focus on, then what is the responsibility and what are we to do? The second thing is poverty, of which we have a disproportionate amount of, especially in the U.S.-Mexico border, not specific of this border alone, but that's the region that I'm the most familiar with and one that we certainly need to do something, do more or do better of. And the more investment we put in human development and human capital, the less of a neglect we're going to see. And therefore, the more of health we will enjoy. So I'm glad that we're focusing on health because without health, we're pretty much nothing. And so my um, observations are the following. As I sort of like look through the trends of health, we've done a pretty good job of focusing on medicine and most recently in the last 30 years, focusing on health, the paradigm. And we're very good about mm, developing the personnel ability to treat the suffering, the human suffering. So on one hand, we have become this wonderful microscopic, wonderful society in which we have the state of the art science and we have some of, the mo some of the best equipped personnel, some of the most caring personnel and well prepared. And so really my observation is, how can we be the most macro in being the very top and the very best of the science and being the most caring so that we understand both and we use a couple of venues that I think I listened to some of the conversations in the last day and a half, but I think we probably may want to spend a little bit more time later or in future conferences. One of them is how do we use behaviors and really begin to understand the behaviors of the people, la gente, the people that have the conditions that have the diseases, so that in behavior, we begin to understand and strategize on how to really reach out, educate, communicate, engage, and involve. That's one specific part. The other is that we also, and I was very, very happy to hear this uh, afternoon, the role of advocacy. Because without advocacy, it's very clear that we're not going to continue to, we're not going to move the needle as fast as we, as we need to as a society and as a world around really looking at health and protection. So advocacy is usually an underutilized set of skills and traditionally we have left it to politicians and to others to do, but we cannot afford, especially as scientists, as researchers and academicians and as healthcare workers and especially the youth. And I'm very enthused that I see youth and I'm assuming that several of your students, graduate students, doctoral students, that you'll soon be practitioners, professionals, or you are, that we need to make the most and the best use of the advocacy in health, and we need to do a better job of training each other on how to use advocacy to communicate and then to mobilize. And the other critical message is uh, we seem to continue to talk about these conditions and diseases in people. However, we need the people that are affected by these conditions to be at the forefront. I think we have learned beautifully from other conditions such as HIV and AIDS on how what happens when you mobilize a community that is affected. My last 10 years of my work, and I think that between now and the time that I expired, I'll continue to do my best to try to stop tuberculosis. I think the lessons, the greatest lessons that I have learned is that we continue to do more of the same expecting to have different results. And that's sort of like the definition of, I think, being crazy, right? But, you know, it's clear that we need to change. And so unless we really mobilize the people that are affected by these conditions, and they're part of the statistic, not only in terms of cases and numbers, but they're also the voices that can help us to humanize, I think will help us to frame the conversations so that we can get to the policy decision makers much more effectively. And so, therefore, they can relate to the constituents and we can move away from groups and people at risk. As much as I want to understand and appreciate risk, the reality is that unless we frame some of these conversations around neglect, poverty differently, others are going to look to us and say, that's not our problem, or that's the problem of another country, another community, or a territory, and these are not our neighbors. And so I, I just put that up you know, for your consideration. A few other things that I wanna that I wanna share. Uh, framing of how we talk about neglected uh, conditions is really important. 
And so we know the data, and I was very glad to be reminded that uh, it's the message, and it's the messengers, and it's the audience. And sometimes we continue to preach to us. That is sort of like this wonderful choir of committed individuals, advocates, and that's comfortable. I feel comfortable doing that. But the reality is that probably we need to look around and see who's missing from these important conversations. Uh, secondly, we need to look at how effectively we do our communication. And we really be the most, we need to be the most open to receiving those comments and criticisms because it may be that we're not being as effective as we thought we could. We could. Um, don't get caught in our own groups. Work on a strategy, especially long term. Storytelling has been a very powerful tool that I have been using for the last 10 years as I, I have tried to put my arms around conditions such as tuberculosis and you know mechanisms like photo voice, storytelling, testimonials can really help you to humanize and to bring the very best of the story and more importantly to talk about survival and overcoming these conditions. Um, I cannot sort of like end without really reminding us that tuberculosis is a neglected condition. And as much as it's not part of the group, depending on who's defining the group, when it comes to the U.S.-Mexico border region and actually be young, it is a condition that traditionally gets forgotten, that it's not sexy, profitable in the sense that it doesn't really get to the media unless we have the crisis. And so let us also look at what is being done in the area of tuberculosis. Let us join hands as we discuss other neglected tropical conditions so that we can embrace what we can do in tuberculosis to protect the community from the macrobacteria. And while we're doing that, then we, I think we won't miss as many opportunities as we have to really promote and protect health. At the end of the day, every minute we have one individual that dies anywhere in the world from tuberculosis. We have 15 new cases of infection. We have close to 1.5 million lives lost, and that is totally unacceptable, knowing what we know about the condition. And we have close to a half a million people that die actually living with AIDS as a result of having tuberculosis that goes untreated or late found, not properly screened and that implies disability and loss. So these are some observations. We can probably have a little bit more conversation as the afternoon progresses. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Blanca Lomelli, who is the Senior Technical Officer for Local Capacity Strengthening and Integrated Health and Country Director for Project Concern International, PCI, in Mexico. PCI is a global health and humanitarian organization dedicated to, dedicated to community health development through integrated holistic programs. Dr. Lamelli has over 29 years of experience in the field of community and health medicine. Please help me to welcome Dr. Lamelli. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, thank you, Tony, for the invitation. I, I wanted to start with a confession. I'm not an expert on TDs. Um, but I've worked uh, over the last uh, 15 years on uh, tuberculosis, um, comorbidities related to tuberculosis, TB, HIV, AIDS, and TB diabetes, um, H1N1 uh, with, the, with the Mexican government, and uh, lately on the Ebola response in, in Liberia, because that's where we have programs. PCI is uh, an international uh, nonprofit organization, non-governmental organization working in um, 16 countries and including Mexico and the US and obviously uh, West Africa and, and other, other parts of the world. So from that perspective, you know, I, I just wanted you to understand the, the context of my, my uh, comments or recommendations um, because I have not, no, not done direct work with uh, NTDs. I'm not gonna tell you what we do because that's, <laughs> there's nothing there. Um, but I wanted to share some of the lessons that I think can apply to the responses and the strategies and interventions and certainly the policies that we need to de and develop to address these diseases. And, and one of them, being the last person speaking in, at the last <laughs> session, during the last session has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one of them is that almost everything has been said. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and, and repeat that anyways because I, I think those are important messages, so forgive me. Um, so one of the lessons or recommendations is that we address um, the response to these diseases uh, from a pers person center approach. Um, I think that's something that we've learned in the work that we've done, again, tuberculosis, um, HIV, um, H1N1, and, and obviously um, Ebola. Um, 
it's, 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 we usually think in terms of the health system, you know, needs, you know, what we can do from our infrastructure, from our, um, from our current uh, systems and, 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 and processes, but we rarely think uh, from the perspective of the person affected. I was reading a report last night from a um, WHO meeting in Indonesia, I think, about NTDs that said that um, it is uh, neglected tropical diseases, but it's basically diseases that affect those uh, people who are neglected. So if we start to think uh, from that perspective, then we begin to have uh, hopefully a more comprehensive approach to the solutions that we uh, propose or, or implement. So that's, that's the first recommendation. The second, and that has been um, mentioned since yesterday, uh, poverty alleviation, you know, the more, the less poverty there is, higher education and lower risk and vulnerability so that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the solutions need to address um, that aspect. Um, also, the fact that if there's something that we've learned about these diseases is that the solution is not within the health or biomedical uh, sectors. You know, we need to go outside, certainly engage other partners in other sectors, labor, housing, education, uh, private sector. Um, otherwise, we cannot, we really cannot address because we cannot address uh, poverty, we cannot address uh, these diseases. It's prevention and control. Um, if I'm speaking too fast, let me know. You have two more minutes. Um, okay. How much? Two. No way. Um, so I think there's also the need for better collaboration between academic institutions, policymakers, and, and program implementers. Um, I would also think that we should shift the approach we have to learning um, in terms of what we do. Um, not only learning uh, to analyze data and make informed decisions um, at every level, but also learning uh, from the perspective of the of the virus or the bacteria or the parasite, you know, why do they behave the way they do? Like, you know, when does um, um, latent TB become active? You know, when when the bacteria senses that you know you have uh, one condition that is going to maybe cause you to die, so that's when it becomes uh, to great symptoms. So it can be spread, you know, to other people. That's that's why it becomes active. It's not. Well, anyways, um, so that's one of the uh, recommendations. Also, the need to invest in local health teams. They're the ones who are out there um, addressing the diseases, engaging the communities, and making or not diagnosis and, 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 and providing treatment. Um, community mobilization uh, from the uh, perspective of the, of the people affected and the communities affected. And um, finally, I want to say that these conditions are not going to be solved without better leadership and better political will. Um, I've learned from Eva that you have to create some um, discomfort for people to move people to action. And I think the Pope said it the other day, you know, um, comfort the afflicted and, and afflict the comfortable. So we need to do more of that. Very Thank good. you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. What great words to end on. Um, so one of the things that all of these panelists have in common is not that they're necessarily experts um, in NTDs, but that they've all done tremendous things in their fields through policy and advocacy work. Um, so I'm going to open the floor to questions. This is a great opportunity to learn from their best practices and what works to move the needle in policy to promote the health of the population. Questions? Yes, uh, Peter, go first. So I want to get to uh, Mr. Nazio Zandrews' comment about um, you know, President Bush reading uh, the, the book about influenza. And, and, and I know that's, that's influenced the whole creation of BART and the Biodefense Advanced Research Development Agency and $5 billion and everything. It, it had a downside. And, and it's not a criticism of President Bush. He did more for NTDs than, than any other president. But he created this uh, juggernaut, which is focused in my moments of frustration. I call it the imaginary illnesses that scare white people, <laughs> um, at occurring at the expense of 12 million Americans now living with neglected tropical diseases that are already here and that we completely ignore. Uh, and you know, and the, the symptom of that is what happened with Ebola. It was 24. Seven with CNN on Ebola, you know the world was blowing up when one person had Ebola and two nurses got infected. The, the sky was falling, and again I would say you know and this was the 
when I was in C when I was on actually CNN didn't like what I had to say, so I was stuck with the, <laughs> the two on either side, MSNBC and Fox News, and say, you know, it's it's I'm not worried about Ebola, but I'm worried about 12 million Americans. How can we bring it back? How can we uh, kind of get away from? these really scary pandemic threats that we're investing billions in when we have a disease, disease like toxicoriasis affecting 2.8 million African Americans living in poverty, there's not a, there's not a single NIH grant uh, mm. given, given on disease. Well, let me, let me first speak about the, it's not an imaginary threat, Peter, I, I, I know you know that. I'm being provocative. I know you're being provocative, but let me, let me just say, uh, Bill Gates said the black swan event of the next century will be the next pandemic. I, is likely, it make it right. no, it doesn't make it right, because he's wrong sometimes, I know he does, but he, in my view, he happens to be right. Um, I'm here, interestingly enough, because of the bubonic plague epidemic, let me tell you why. Um, my family comes from the island of Corfu, my mother's family, in the Adriatic. Greek island off the coast, very charming island. There is a bubonic plague epidemic there. I believe it was in the six, late 16th century. Six Greek families left the island, and they were prosperous and wealthy, educated families. They had the money to leave. They left during the epidemic to go up in the Pindos Mountains in what is now southern Albania. It was ethnically Greek at that time to escape, and they stayed there for 400 years. Wow. And then they, escaped, they came to the United States in the early 100 years ago, okay? So I often point out that my trajectory to the United States was made possible by the bubonic plague <laughs> in a very interesting way, okay? And I'll bet many of you don't realize 25% of the population of the world died because of the, bon the Black Death, 25% of the population of the world. Now you all say, well that, you know, that was a thousand years ago, who cares, it's not gonna affect 100 million people. At the upper end of the estimates died more, I mean, more people died because there were so many more people. In two billion people in the world in 1918, and the upper end of the estimates is now maybe 100 million people. They didn't keep records in large parts of the world. The original estimate was 21 million, okay? And now they revise that saying we didn't count Africa, we didn't count you know, uh, large parts of South Asia. And uh, I said, well, how could you have done an estimate without only counting the West? I mean, that's preposterous. 650,000 Americans died. And the disease is, has, a, for those of you who are scientists, has an extremely high R0 factor. R0 is the efficiency with which the disease spreads from one person to another. Now, I don't think it necessarily will be the flu that becomes the catalytic event. But the difference is that if we have that event, it is going to have profound consequences. And it's not just a matter of the people who died, it's the collapse of economies, the world, uh, the, it'll spread likely through the airports. I mean, there have been simulations done on this. It will shut down the airports and it will have a profound economic effect. The economy will, economies will collapse over it. No, I'm like, so, so I know, but, but let me just, I mean, that's real, okay? Now, what do we do about the other diseases? Well, frankly, you need to do what you're doing. I would have strongly advised you against doing what you did to the White House. That's why you didn't get the money and the conference. You don't go to politicians and tell them, it doesn't make any difference to the liberals or conservatives or, they're politicians. I know how they think because I was a I politician for 12 years. Once. Pardon me? I had an N of one who worked once. <laughs> <laughs> well, well but, but the problem is uh, uh, they want simple answers, simple solutions, and they want sound bites. I'm, by the way, that's, what they told me. that's right. I, I was in office for 12 years in Massachusetts in the House of Representatives, and my staff used to go nuts because I do not do sign buzz very well, even though I was in office for all those years. So uh, I would have talked to someone who can do things in sound bites, and I would frankly have merged them together, Peter, and, and, and presented the case. The, uh, the different things that you were describing, surveillance and all, don't go into all of that with politicians. It's just you don't do that. <laughs> we, we, we didn't, when, we, when I wanted some money from home, I never explained all that stuff. We got the money we wanted. You simplify everything, there, and you tell them what the consequences are if you don't do it. The, the way we get all these federal officials to, to come to College Station, Texas, they didn't even know where College Station, Texas was, okay? 
I didn't even know a college station before I came to the Bush <laughs> School, okay? Why did they come? Because they all have read the literature on what could happen if we have a pandemic. What are the consequences of people not being treated for these diseases? There are consequences. There are economic consequences, there are social consequences. Uh, and it, you don't just talk about the disease, you talk about the other tentacles that, that, that uh, affect our society in a profound way. Uh, and I, I mean, this is not the place to, 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 to go through a strategy with you, but it's, it's politics, Peter. The, when you, someone said here, someone said here in the last panel that we do these econometric models and we do this modeling. If you think modeling makes decisions in Washington, you're living <laughs> in a fantasy world. I can tell you how politicians, I ran the budget office of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I was a technical person in that respect, and I know how I made decisions. Now, I know what the substance is, but if you couldn't explain to the legislature and the governor in a very small number of words why you were raising or cutting a budget, you're a toast. Mm -hmm. So politics has a lot to do with this. It's not a function of whether your case is a good one or not. Yes. Yeah, I have a question, especially for, for uh, I guess, Karina, Eva, and Blanca, because you work directly with communities and it goes back to something that Peter showed. Look, when I look at those pictures of the deformed feet and eyes that are infected and things like that, that is not appealing at all. <laughs> that is not a pretty picture, and I kind of turn away, right? So how do we create a campaign uh, and do what you said, which is humanize the victim, the, 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 the patient, the person, and then make it appealing uh, and appeal to the humanity of the politician or the or the funder or whoever to get attention to those 12 million people or 1.5 billion. What what is the marketing strategy to get that? It's, they're not going to be Magic Johnson with the a HIV. They're not going to be uh, uh, Brangelina or anything like. It. Th these are people who are faceless, who are nobodies. So how do you get a nobody to be a somebody and present it, him or her, in the face of the people that can make a difference in the political world? Is there any particular strategy that you have tried to draw attention to that that will work marketing-wise? I'll be happy to share with you what I have learned in the last 10 years about humanizing different conditions, uh, such as tuberculosis, HIV, as well as homelessness, intimate partner violence, you know, um, among some. And uh, there are methods. One of them is the photo voice method. Um, it's first published back in 1994. And it basically gives cameras, in this case, very unsophisticated disposable cameras. You can do digital cameras. Nowadays, you can do smart, uh, smartphones. But it's not only the photographing. You work with members of vulnerable community. In this case, it would be members of the neglected community that are living or experiencing any of these conditions, and you invite them, which means that you need to have a report and you need to have a relationship with the people that you serve, and they need to trust you. And you train your participants, in this case referred to as patients, so that they understand the ethics of taking photography, they understand the use of cameras as powerful tools, but more importantly, they get trained on the basics of how to photograph their lives and their experience with these conditions. Mm. And you don't tell them what to photograph. The beauty of this technique is that they, they live the condition. They are the experts of their own neglected situation. And they begin to photograph their lives. And we as academicians or facilitators that are trained on this method, we facilitate the process so that there is the framing of questions. Mm. So really the questions are really powerful because then the participants become co-researchers. And they learn how to do content analysis, which sounds familiar to graduate and doctoral students. But here, they are really leading the research and the findings of this research, which is photography, with storytelling in the context of their lives, is amplified in a way that they are the ones presenting their story, Dodi. And then when they present their story, I usually do, with almost every photo voice project, a call to action which means that it's not enough for you to humanize your experience and to talk about the disparities or the challenges or the human suffering or the survival of how Chagas or any other condition really brought the very best of your life because maybe it's horrible, yet you were able to be connected with systems of care, 
you found the very best of the healthcare establishment or the system, and so therefore your life has changed. So there are positive things that may come out. And once they're able to present this photographic experience, they prepare a call to action. And we facilitate an audience like you. But in this case, the audience is a group of policy decision makers in which we don't embarrass, but we educate, the educated. And we do so in a way that the people that have been the most disempowered, that are usually neglected and almost invisible, have a voice, have a say. And you bring the scientists, and you bring the data, and you augment and complement. But in my opinion, Tony, that has been probably one of the most powerful tools to, one, educate the educated, to advocate, to keep the momentum, and then to ask the policy decision makers to make a public commitment. And they don't make the public commitment to me, they're making the public commitment to the people affected by these conditions. Which means that then I have the opportunity to follow up with them and hold them accountable. Without embarrassing them, I'm gonna follow up and say, I believe you committed to the following, so how is it that I can be helpful to you? So you said you're gonna protect the budget, and we see that they're about to cut it, and you said that publicly. So what is it that we can do to make sure that you keep your word, but at the same time you are consistent with what you said that you would do? And so, and you publish, and you disseminate, and you promote, and you amplify, and methods like that around tuberculosis, HIV, diabetes, health disparities have been extremely um, effective. We have a book that just came out, it's called Gender, Health, and Empowerment, if you're interested. There's a chapter there on the use of photo voice for intimate partner violence with migrants. And then there's another wonderful chapter that we co-author on advocacy, communication, and social mobilization in tuberculosis, in which we describe the methods. We talked about person-centered care and about using dots which is the direct observed therapy, to really name it empowering dots. Because really, it's very disempowering when you start looking at tuberculosis. We do trust you, but we don't trust you enough for you to take the medication. So how do we make the most out of 105 experiences that we have to supervise your treatment, in which we're centering your care, but we also address all the other health and human service needs that you may have? So again, one example of how a uh, few articles published on the subject. And then there's another initiative you want to uh, Google. It's called Nuestra Casa uh, Initiative.net, like our home, our home. And it's the use of art, photography, photo voice, and call to action. Has been one of the most powerful things we have done to really bring greater awareness of health disparities along the US Mexico border. Great, thank you. One of the challenges that we face doing that is. Because we've had Al Jazeera America down here, we've had NBC down here, uh, a couple of other journalists who, who get intrigued by what we've been writing and talking about and seeing in our clinic. And they want to come down here and they'll, they'll go to the fifth floor of Houston, that kind of, then they want to talk to a patient. And, and, and that's fair enough, uh, but it's been challenging because, I mean, our patients are patients of nothing. They're the poorest, poorest of the poor, and they're very shy, and they don't want to talk on camera, and they're highly stigmatized. And so that's been one of the big challenges that we faced, and why, why, why we, we get the journalists in, they're, they're here, they're, they're ready to write the story, and then the year goes up because Patients don't want to appear on camera, they don't want to talk to you. Go ahead, Dr. That's even assuming we get around the HIPAA stuff, which is also a challenge. Well, through the, through the photo voice process, they, they go through a, an empowerment process. I mean, I know that word has been overused, um, but you don't, you just don't, you know, throw them in front of the cameras. You know, you, you work with them and you help them um, empower themselves, and they really do. I mean, there's nothing. Um, as strong as a mother that has had a child misdiagnosed um, and almost dying from from TB, and you know how how she empowered herself to to now be uh, addressing decision makers and politicians and business people. It's, it's it's very powerful, but but you need to go through that process with them. So you need to invest in doing that. I mean, we we did the work with um, in tuberculosis together. That's that's. Um, why I wanted to say something, but I also wanted to say that even when you have the policy in place, then in order for you to change the, the care 
or the prevention or the quality of the services, you also need to empower um, the healthcare providers. And we also use photo, vi photo voice to empower uh, healthcare workers uh, working in tuberculosis throughout Mexico. We work in 13 states across the country. Without that, I mean, most of the statement discrimination was coming from inside the health system. So we needed to address that first. And granted, it was a project that lasted eight years, so we had enough time to change uh, the perspective and change the approach from a, from a health system center approach to a person center approach um, that it continues to be in place um, to this day. Okay, we are just about out of time. In um, just a moment, I'm gonna invite our panelists to sum up in one sentence for us um, their advice for shaping policy for NTD control and prevention. So um, I think some of the common themes that we've heard here today is that how you frame it is important, storytelling is important, humanizing the topic is, is incredibly important, Collaboration um, is also very important. And what I heard over and over in this panel and all day actually was that um, you have to get involved. It's not enough to be in the lab, publish, read your colleagues' papers, get your grant, and go back to the lab. It's, it's vitally important for everyone to give voice to this issue and to talk from multiple perspectives. All right, panelists, one sentence. Let's sum it up. Um, yesterday, uh, a student asked, what is a neglected disease? Could you define a neglected disease in three words or in three sentences? And I thought neglected disease is a disease without treatment. Um, I think it's not only treatment in terms of pills, that you have the, the treatment uh, there today, but it's also lack of access to health care, lack of access to diagno diagnosis, and proper tests to have your diagnosis and your confirmation in, in in few minutes and not have to wait two or three months and has the build and has the correct follow-up and has also the doctor or the nurses trained so they can look for the disease they can ask and or they can even think about uh, the disease and one thing important that she said that is it must be really a connection between what, what is uh, uh, universities uh, doing um, documents or the, uh, doing papers and what we are doing every day in, in the field, no? what is operational and, and what is really um, the scientist uh, part. We really need both uh, together to work. We, we cannot uh, only treat patients. We need people to do research. We need right. people to invest uh, time and effort and resources to invest and to get new drugs and to get new diagnosis tests. And we need also people uh, to be in the field and, and to really want to look for these patients, that they are really poor uh, uh, and that nobody look for them. So we need both things. And we need also politicians that are able to, to listen and to invest uh, money on this on this poll. Great, thank you. All right, Mr. Nazi has one sentence. Yeah, Sum it I up. would not use the word treatment. Treatment implies that it's a chronic thing, you have to keep, keep being treated. I'd use the word cure. Cure. I think most of these, I don't know all of the, the medical uh, uh, responses to each of these diseases, but I think they all have cures, do they not? It's not like HIV where you have to take the medication the rest of your life, or is it? Uh, so, some have cures, uh, some don't. Okay. I would focus on the word cure. You know the, that there's another campaign, uh -huh. the cure. Cure. Because okay? it implies finality, that you, you're, 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 you're defeating the disease. Great. And cure. It's four letter word, too. Four letter word. Thank you. Moving on. I can do a sentence, but I'm going to say when we think of poverty, we need to really be looking at roots of poverty. We need to identify missed opportunities that we have in front of us in both the health, the medical, the educational, and the training uh, settings. And we need to be brief in what we do, be bold, and then be active. Great. Thank you. Everything they said, plus um, I would say, uh, I would insist again on, on better collaboration and conversations uh, between academia, policymakers, and program implementers. I don't think we, we understand each other enough, and I don't think we, we talk to each other enough in a way that is, that is useful. Thank you. Please help me in thanking all of our panelists for an excellent panel. Thank you.
Thank you, Anna. That was a terrific discussion. A great, great panel discussion. Thank you to the panelists, and thank you all for staying to the end. Uh, really thrilled to see that there's so many people uh, still remaining. Uh, it's been a long day. It's almost five o'clock, and uh, I know you don't want to. The last thing you want to see is a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> but what what I'm going to do is just give a, a few slides. I've been taking notes uh, throughout the day, so this includes everything up to the final panel discussion. Uh, just to kind of give you my, my version of the wrap up. And I'm sure this is going to engender a lot of other discussion and follow up and maybe uh, uh, maybe we'll have, maybe we'll, uh, we'll give you some insight about that. So let's quickly kind of go through this. Um, uh, we started out talking about uh, some uh, NTD victories. We had the comments from the Minister of Health who talked about the amazing achievements in eliminating rabies, trachoma, leprosy, onchocerciasis, and malaria. Um, but there's places where we're not doing so well. And I think this is really what it comes down to. These are the key diseases that I took away from, from our meeting of where, we, and it turns out that they're shared between Texas and Mexico. So the vector-borne diseases were big time the arbovirus infections, dengue, uh, chikungunya, uh, West Nile virus, Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, and a couple of helminth infections. So this is where uh, I think we need to focus our efforts. One of the important themes is this is not a border issue. So, you know, so much of the narrative about disease and we talk about Mexico is things are coming across our southern border and I think what was what came clear out of this is it it just so happens there it's, it's wherever poverty is so there's poverty in the southern United States and there's poverty in southern Mexico and those are where the hot spots are so it's not there's maybe a part part of a border issues part of it but it's not the the main message and I think we have to emphasize that because especially in this current political environment there's so much uh, 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 excitement around uh, building walls and things like that that we don't want to we don't want to send that message so a key fa some key facts came out the importance of social determinants how these diseases reinforce poverty interfere with what was called family labor economic educational and community development uh, I uh, I think it was Roberto Tapia who mentioned that 70% of people who live in poverty in Mexico are girls and women. I, I didn't appreciate that until today, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same in the United States as well. So this you know, may turn out to come down to be a girls and women's issue also, and that's something that we're going to need to do a deeper dive on. Uh, also, the statement has made the modest required investment that was needed to eliminate all those diseases in Mexico uh, that wouldn't, wouldn't exceed 0.1% of domestic health spending. That's very important in this, in this environment of fiscal austerity. Um, in terms of the US and, Mexico, U.S. and Mexico, we saw a lot of similarities between the, the <laughs> I don't know where I got these pictures, I was just <laughs> done We saw a lot of similarities between uh, the diseases. So again, it was a common theme, arboviruses, Chagas disease, helminth infections, links with poverty, disproportionately affecting girls and women, and here are the needs. We need to do a better job measuring the real burden of disease, uh, understanding the health economics, especially from the comments Bruce Lee made, uh, ensuring access to treatment and prevention, incentives for R&D, training health community workers, uh, really investigating the social determinants. And there are some differences um, that um, in Mexico, there's a heavy emphasis on malnutrition being rural diseases and associated with iron deficiency anemia. In the U.S., I think it's a more urbanized environment. So I think there are, so it's not an identical situation. There are, there are some differences. Uh, there was a nice talk by Roberto on dengue as a paradigmatic disease uh, and what we should focus on. Uh, here's the gaps, uh, disease burden, hospitalization, DALI's annual costs, epidemiological surveillance. The clinical decision making I thought was very important because we don't have, and we don't, physicians are not trained in the U.S. to think about these diseases, so there's no algorithms in place. Investment in human capital, including community workers. Uh, thinking about it, uh, when we're going to introduce new interventions like a dengue vaccine, there may be dengue vaccine introduction in the United States, uh, taking a think tank approach and public policy through public-private partnerships. So uh, I think, you know, look, looking at that list, I think we really have to think about uh, doing a gap analysis for each of those diseases that we've listed uh, for Chagas, Leash, 
the arbovirus infections and the two helminth infections, it would be nice to take a gap analysis as Roberto has done for dengue and do it for those diseases. But we have to do some additional things as well. So adding to the gap analysis or looking at these water shifts, investigating the role of climate change, which I think would be clearly important. Also, um, the promoting awareness, uh, zero awareness among physicians and healthcare professionals, uh, educating the public, educating students, a uh, high priority. Uh, and then we also have to add to the gap analysis all the R&D that's needed to understand transmission studies, new drugs, new vaccines, point of care diagnostics. There's no point in having a diagnostic test if you have to ship it out to Atlanta to the CDC and wait, wait six weeks for it to get done, uh, insecticides. And then we have the problem with messaging challenges. Um, uh, these are complex diseases. There's not a simple solution. I love to. I like. I like what Mr. Nazio said about using the term cure when we can do it, but we can't always do it. So somebody pointed out that we've got to say what. What I think it was Sarah. What, what's the head story? What's the what's the heart story? And I think we need to really go in on that for each of those of those diseases. And maybe there's going to be some commonalities between all of them. We also have a lot of ignorance. Um, we have. <laughs> It's get, it was getting late. Um, uh, you know, we want to blame immigration. We want to blame laziness. People should be able to help themselves. We have to really get a, get away from that uh, narrative. Uh, and so I think the gap analysis is a major theme here and how we're going to do this for all of the major diseases and the fact that it's going to require a, a very modest investment if indeed we need to look at that if it's only going to exceed 0.1% of domestic health spending. That's still a lot of money in the U.S., but we'll have to see. And then finally, Bruce mentioned the, pop, the looking at this as a systems problem. And I think you know, we didn't really have time to go into it in a lot of detail, but I think that's worth a, a deeper dive uh, as well. So thank you very much for coming today. It was a great day. Thank you so much to the organizers. Uh, and Veronica, thank you. Thank you for making this happen.